So we had this really, I mean, I don't even remember how many years ago it was, at least two years ago, we had this really interesting conversation that went every which way about niching, I think it was, about the experience of niching and the risk of trying niches that you don't, you haven't worked in before versus not. And I don't even remember what the conclusion was. I feel like we were just kind of exploring. And I think it got a lot mm -hmm. of people's ideas, their brains turning. And then uh, we spoke a couple months ago and you were like, I've had new thoughts. <laughs> Do you remember this? Oh, a hundred percent. I've been kind of dreading what? this because it's like, I have to own being wrong. Oh my but gosh. I think that's healthy. Yeah. Well, uh, that's to suggest that there's a right and a wrong to this. And I don't think that's true. Well, that's a good point. Yeah. We're talking about stuff that always involves complexity and that makes it hard to say, well, this is right and this is wrong. Cause there's so many other things that are connected to the thing you're saying is maybe right or wrong. Right. I was going to say at the end of, I want to say 2022, I wrote a big, long post, what I've changed my mind about. Ooh. And I did the same thing at, or end of 2021, and same thing at end of 2022, what I've changed my mind about. And I really continue to think this, uh, maybe you're immune from like uh, needing to change your mind. Maybe you were so correct um, <laughs> when you got started that you haven't had to update how you think about things, but- I hope I don't think that. <laughs> I I was feeling like better about everything when I wrote that post and I was like we should, everybody should do this what a yearly post what you've changed your mind about it should be a requirement if you give advice to other people you should be required to do it that's the kind of stuff I was saying uh -huh. and since then I've I feel like I've come to a more humble position about a number of things so I'm you've not sure changed, I would insist that, you've changed right. your mind again <laughs> Once again, yet again, well, you can't do that okay. too much or people start to think, when are you going to say something that I can trust for more than six months? <laughs> mm. There's a balance there. But anyway, yeah, some stuff I've changed my mind about, I think is the general topic of when you're specializing, how much risk should you take on? Have you read the book, Play Bigger? Go, is it Play Bigger? I think it's about uh, category design, category creation. Okay. Have you heard of this heard of topic? No. Okay. You've heard of the idea, the notion of like become a category of one. That I say. You say that. Yeah. I okay. say that, but I didn't get it from this book. I'm, I'm where, sure where I did... got it from a book, but it was a long time ago. Okay. Yeah. We don't remember where. Okay. No. I think there's different ways to interpret that. How do you interpret that idea? And this is like what inter introverts do, right? They start interviewing the interviewer because uh -huh. <laughs> they like deflect attention. Anyway, um, let's start there though. What's your sure. interpretation of? Okay. Well, so I started saying, you know, be in a category of one probably 10 years ago in my personal branding quest. So trying to understand how to stand out in a, mm. in the market. And so mm -hmm. things that allowed me to be in a category of one are things I wrote about in my book, these four angles, you know, this contrarian personality, right? Worst of all design, badass brands without the BS, this unique, uh, process. We build brands in one to three day intensives again, no BS, mm -hmm. you know, the intersection of these two things, how many branding agencies out there are both of those things to such an extreme. Okay. Well now I'm in a category of one, you know, there's other people doing something, some of those things, but there's not anyone doing exactly that. So if you like this, I'm it. Um, so that's, mm -hmm. that's how I define it. I, I hear you saying become a subcategory of one. Okay. And to me, that's such a huge distinction because like one interpretation and, and really I'm, I'm warming up to, <laughs> to sort of cr critiquing the way I used to do things. One interpretation of that idea is you can become this whole new category that has no, not a, not no reference point maybe, but it's just so totally unique in, in so many ways. Or you can do what you said, which is become a subcategory of one. So the category is design work or mm -hmm. branding, right? Mm -hmm. Or design heavy branding or whatever, right? Like, so that's the category. And I think the problem with inventing a whole new category is, do you know if people want to buy that thing or not? And I started seeing places where I was a little too eager to sign off on people inventing a whole new category. So, you know, when I started out and 
got interested in positioning and specialization and so forth. You know, I had this interesting mix of sort of inputs from the world of customer uh, development research. So that's the side, well, more broadly from the world of products. I was hearing people give advice about how to design digital products and trying to find a way that that advice would apply to the world of services. And I've had to do a lot of cleanup work from that contamination um, because a lot of the advice from the world of products doesn't translate, I don't think. Okay, what's what's an example? You, what's the top of mind example for product advice that you cannot apply to the world of services? Or, let's say product marketing or product design oh. advice. I think product businesses, not all of them, but many of them can just sort of spend their way into awareness in the market that in a way that services businesses can't. Yes. That's another big difference. So, you know, if you're a product business and you're like, well, um, I'm thinking of, uh, uh, I think it's Qualtrics. So they're like a survey uh, market research product company. They have some services kind of um, integrated into the product, but it's mostly a product business. And um, I think that they did this category creation thing and they are now the experience uh, something company, right? Like they okay. want to help you uh, assess and measure customer experience. Okay, but they've got, a, they've got a budget to spend on educating the market as to what that is. Yes. Services businesses that, you know, of the scale that I usually work with do not have that kind of budget. They do not have the patience. They do not have the discipline. They just, they just can't invest that deeply in category creation. Well, and the and ROI also, isn't there because the scale isn't there. Yeah. Like that's a big disconnect between what works and is totally native to the world of, uh, you know, product marketing. And it's just like, it just does not translate to the world of services. Another thing that I think comes from the world of product marketing is this idea that you can do research to discover unmet customer needs and then build to meet those needs. So the easiest example would be, you know, what feature should we build next for this product that we have? We already have users, we have revenue, now we want to grow, um, what do we build next? And so you get, you know, usually UX researchers to help you prioritize that or refine your ideas or what have you. And that works great in the world of products, but how do you apply that idea to the world of services? I mean, you. You sort of could, but you would mostly do the research from the people you're already talking to, right? And it might be, well, we want to tweak the service or refine it or what have you. But the idea that you would discover some groundswell of, of need in the market broadly that you could design a service from scratch to meet mm. is so full of risk and, and ways for it to not go well. Well, and on top of that, when you're a service business, your com like your your raw material is your own skills and experience. So you're not gonna Another. say like, oh, that need is there. So now what? You're gonna acquire all of these skills. You've got skills. You got to build your business based on what you already have. Maybe you up your game, you build more of those skills, but you're not going to start in a new place. That is another huge disconnect. Yeah. So the the product company they've got funding or they've got a, a going concern that's generating revenue and they can much more easily acquire what they need in terms of, uh, let's just think of a digital product, mm -hmm. you know, developer talent to build that feature. And as exactly as you said, in the world of services, okay, you know, at a certain scale, you could hire the expertise you need from, you know, and, and build out your team in a certain way. But if it's more of these smaller businesses that I tend to work with, you know, it's the, the ability to do that is really limited. And even so, even if you could do that, bringing in those new skills might be sort of disruptive to the way the business operates and the workflow and the process. And, or you might need a whole different sales approach than you know, like selling, maybe the selling that thing successfully requires that you interact at a higher layer of the 
uh, client business than you have been. And you're just not good at talking to the C-suite. You're fine talking to middle managers. You understand their world. They trust you. But the, the C-suite just is like, who is this person? Mm-hmm. You don't have like the credibility or the, the right lingo or the right approach to communicate effectively with them. All of those are reasons why it's so much harder in the world of services to just bolt on a whole new thing, a whole new expertise. The development of expertise takes more time and it's much more organic. You know, it's like, like an sort of like an ecosystem expanding in a certain direction, not just dropping in the new expertise. You can do that. And software developers in particular are kind of forced to do that maybe at a higher cadence than other professions, but it's still, it's hard. It's not, and it's risky. Mm-hmm. You know, this all to me kind of comes back to the risk thing that we're, we started talking right. about just, um, uncritically applying advice from the product world has so many ways to go wrong. <laughs> so many failure points. So I had, I mean, for me, uh, getting better at advising people in the services world has been a process, I think, of kind of pruning out some of those ideas from the mix mm, and yeah. saying, well, yeah, I mean, yes, there are very popular books that say you can do that, but those are for product people, not for us. I'm so glad you're saying that because actually I remember when I first started writing my book and I felt like I was the first person who had ever realized this, I remember thinking, branding and everything I've read about branding and everything I see as advice about branding is just not distinguishing between these different kinds of businesses and different sizes of businesses. They're just talking about branding as if it's this one idea. And it's why I think so many small service businesses specifically, which is who we both work with, have always struggled with branding because it's something that if you ever are using Apple I always use Apple, Nike, Ralph Lauren as the examples mm-hmm. of branding. And then you try to apply it. It's the same thing. You're taking a, a an application to a huge company that is also selling products and you're trying to apply it to a small service business. It's, nothing is the same about that. It looks the same. And I'll tell you when I, um, the, the nuances of those differences, like you said, the seat, oh, once you add this service on, well, now you might be talking to a different level of consumer. You mm-hmm. might have to talk about it a certain way. These nuanced ch- challenges are things that, in my experience at least, sometimes you can't even foresee them until you're doing it and it's not working and you start to realize it. Because when I first launched my first digital product, which was my boot camp 2016, 17, I thought it's the brand up boot camp. And I hear so many people in my industry do this. It's a lower priced thing for all the people who can't afford my services. And it took me at least a year to realize, oh my God, this is a completely different business. I might as well be selling shoes <laughs> because right. I, I, com- different infrastructure, different marketing, different messaging, different market, like all the things are different. Just because I call it the brand up boot camp and my service is a brand up means nothing <laughs> about the fact that these are completely different. So I, I feel like those those sometimes it's hard to see that you don't know what you don't know. And so for that reason, it's like important to send this message. I'm really glad you're bringing this up. I think this is most of us have a pretty limited experience of selling the thing you sell to a a limited scope of buyers, right? I think that's most of us. Like, you know, we kind of find a groove. Oh, these people seem to, you know, I click with them and they, they seem to get it when I explain the value. And so, you know, you just kind of gravitate into that groove. But just look inside yourself. I, I do this all the time. I notice my buying behavior when the circumstances or the context or the goal is different for me. Okay, um, I'm in the grocery store. I'm in a hurry. And so you kind of observe your behavior in that context versus, oh, I'm like researching this thing. I don't really need it. It's, it's a piece of furniture we're thinking about getting. There's no timeline. There's no deadline. There's no urgency. And you just notice how differently you behave in those two circumstances. And it's you, you have a sort of uh, front row seat to what it's like to selling to different people. Like what's going to get me walking out of the grocery store with uh, you know, product X 
in in when I'm in a hurry, there's a deadline. Okay, it's the one that I've bought before. I'm not going to sit there and you know evaluate the brand story of <laughs> different products, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not going to think about which one cares about brand purpose or sustainability more. Those might be important in a different setting. And then, you know, now I've got all in, I'm in this different context, researching the piece of furniture. I've got all the time in the world. Um, maybe I care about that stuff a little bit more. So I think even if we have limited experience, like we've only sold to one kind of buyer for the most part, we can still imagine what it's like to sell to a different kind of buyer. And then you apply that to your business, your livelihood, and you think, okay, how many conversations, okay, you mostly speak to middle managers. You haven't talked to the C-level. How would that go? Let's say you just got set up, you know, someone teed it up for you. I want you to talk to the CEO of this small manufacturing business. I think they could use what you do. Would you know what to say? I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm just highlighting these things that on paper might seem like little subtle differences, but in the real world, it can make a difference, Mm. big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So was this one of the things that you changed your mind on? Which part of it is what you changed your mind on? I would boil it down to uh, category creation is is uh, very risky and expensive and it's probably not for, for you. It's probably not for me. It's probably not for any of us. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, do you mean you were... So I actually just had a conversation with um, a student of mine who's probably listening. You know who you are. Uh, because they were trying to create a new category or it seemed like they were trying to create a new category. That was the goal. But it was really, mm-hmm. it was really a subcategory, and the mm-hmm. the the act of and the effort to make a new category, to me, actually felt like a detour that's going to make it a lot harder to buy because really what you're doing is you're there's so much education involved when there's a new category, <laughs> you have to educate everybody on this first. It's kind of like have you ever heard of the term Maya? I can't remember what it stands for, but the concept is as different as it can be while still being recognizable. Oh, interesting. I think to me, that's really important when you're trying to stand out. You can't change everything. When I first, when Steve and I first went into business um, and he made his website or he had his website that he already had, I was like, where is the button? This thing was like the most creative, you know, it was like a piece (laughs) of art. And he was like, oh, you have to hover over it. And like the click, you click on the different things. What does Maya stand for? Most advanced. Most advanced yet acceptable. <laughs> I ha- that's the first time I'm hearing of that, but it has this sort of instant, oh yeah, I, I think I know what you're talking about. And that's such a great example of the idea itself, right? It's like, I've never heard of that. And then you hear it and then you're like, oh, it sounds like I've known that for a while. It sounds familiar. Yeah. Well, I would, I mean, I bring it up because it seems like that's kind of where you've landed a little bit. I think so. I, I think we're, yeah. You know, I think we're kind of getting into like positioning versus differentiation. Well, explain the difference to our listeners. I'm sure they'd love to hear your take on that. Well, it, it, there's this weird sort of overlap between the two. So you know, your market position. I think you can most easily think of that as uh, how are you thought of by the market? Where do they kind of place you? And a lot of times you know, we'll visualize that with like a simple two by two where you've got two attributes, you know, the X axis and the Y axis represent two different attributes. So one might be cost, you know, and it's easiest to use uh, products again as our examples, because, (laughs) you know, when you're trying to explain something to a group of people and you don't know anything about their background, you assume they have all heard of Apple or Coca-Cola or whatever, right? Right. So we go to the product examples. That does not override the outcome of our previous conversation, which is they're terrible uh, places to take lessons from and apply directly to a services business. Anyway, and so that might be one way that you think about positioning in the market, like where, what position do you occupy? Are you on the expensive end or on the less expensive end? And then there's other attributes too that might distinguish products. So, you know, positioning is like when you take it, take all that into account, where are you in the market? That's one way to think about it. But really in the services world, it tends to be much more, how are you remembered and thought of? Like what's your reputation or, you know, just what are you known for doing? 
that tends to be more what positioning is about in the services world. Differentiation, I think, is more uh, when you start getting compared to others who might be in a similar market position, what makes you different from them? I've come to think that, uh, so I used to think that the work was about positioning. That's where, that was this thing that was this going to be this intricately crafted uh, str strategy decision is your positioning. And that would solve it all. And I think where I'm at now is, mm, no, just fit into an existing category. <laughs> pick the right one. I mean, don't be sloppy about that, but just pick an existing category and then differentiate through things like point of view or the ones that you mentioned, Pia. There's, there's several easy, not, I mean, it's not easy, but simple ways to mm -hmm. do it, right? Deliver the service differently. I think there's overlap, like we, you talked about having this kind of at, attitude. It's not the word you used, but it's that's your how red I'm voice. remembering it. Yeah. That can also overlap a lot with point of view. So maybe that's a thing we need to touch on here in a little bit is, is point of view. But pricing, you know, has positioning implications, but it also could be a way that you, that you differentiate. We charge a lot so that we can deliver this amazing service and not be held back in the way that people who price at lower price points hold themselves back from delivering results for you. You know, all this is like framed in what's what you're doing to help your clients. Oh, we, we don't do 80% of the things that other people do. We focus on 20% that we think makes the, the difference. These are all ways that you could differentiate. And I think it's just better to basically say, <laughs> like if I was going to advise someone on making the position decision, I would say, give yourself a pretty short, limited amount of time to make that decision and then spend the whole rest of your budget for figuring out how to be awesome. <laughs> Figure, spend the rest of your strategy budget on differentiation. Like what's going to be meaningful to the clients you want to work with that makes you different from others in the same category. Don't pick too big and crowded and competitive of a category, but don't try to invent a category either. Again, it's too risky. with the category being really your positioning. I would say so. Here's the, just like the simple applied version of this. Go to LinkedIn, do a keyword search for um, the thing that describes what you do and see who else is there. See who comes up. You can put some filters on headcount, okay? So you're never going, if you're, you know, one person or a team of five people, you're pretty much never going to compete against Accenture <laughs> because, you know, like they're in a whole other world of scale. Okay, so maybe you filter this based on headcount size, but you've got one to three words to describe what you do. Do a search on LinkedIn and see how many other people describe themselves in the same way. You can exclude, you know, people who have a full-time job pretty easily uh, if you want. You're looking for companies or soloists like yourself who use the same language. And just see if you fit in there. See if that's a good, accurate description of what you do. The work's not done, but the positioning work might be done at that point. It's not that hard to find an existing category. Sometimes you have to kind of hunt around to find the right language. There are um, plenty of people that I work with where the thing they do is like not exactly easy to label, but once you find the label, it's obvious. It's mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, that's what I do. Uh, I've got a client who helps people in the research world take the data that they generate and collect and make it more useful. He is a research well, the question was, is he a research software engineer or a research data engineer? And that's a like a category that I bet most people have never heard of. But when we went on LinkedIn and did exactly what I just advised, he found, you know, 30 or to 50 other people who were a lot like him. That would, turned out to be a great category. I think it was research data engineer was the one. Okay, so the, the, the category selection work is done. The positioning work is done. Now he can move on to other things like his point of view. Yeah. Right. So that actually brings up an interesting question, um, which is the, so what did you call it? Data software? Uh, research data research engineer. Research data engineer. Okay. So yeah. is there something to be said for it? Because if you're going to put that in your bio or in your one liner on LinkedIn, 
then yeah. that is that's taking up a, a healthy real estate and yeah. is not going to help you. That's not the differentiating point. That's saying what it's you not. do. And I'm wondering if you have to think about how you describe that positioning in the language of the people that are going to be searching for you, right? Because because sometimes what I find people who are trying to find that category, like we're trying to find that they're not trying to even differentiate. They're just trying to explain what they do to your point. Like, you know, I, what I do has more nuance to it. And, and what am I going to, they, they end up saying things that might be confusing for the very person that's looking for them. And I think that it's like important to, to like, look at the work. Sometimes the thing that we actually do and the position that we actually have is not necessarily the way that we describe it because the people that are looking for us are not going to be looking for that, even though that's what they need. I'll give you a, a, a perfect example in my own business is that I do the brand shrink and wrote a book called Badass Your Brand. And it's really mm -hmm. a business, it's really a business positioning book and a, yeah. a business a business strategy book and a uh, a business strategy engagement the, the branding yeah. being a part of that because it's an important part of it but the reason my experience was over years is that when people who came to me for branding because that's what they wanted and then I gave them the business strategy because that's what they needed they were like wow this is the best branding experience I've ever had it's like well that's because yeah. you needed business strategy and you weren't going to look for it yourself because you didn't know that you needed it. So I yeah. always wonder about that. Like, you know, I kind of tell people choose the thing that people are looking for. I think that's the right advice because if you don't do it that way, if you don't give people, or if you don't at least um, have a, a doorway into your business that has a sign over the top of it, I'm speaking in terms of metaphor here, but mm -hmm. If that sign doesn't say the thing that people have in their mind that they're looking for, now we're back into the problem of market education, which is just so expensive and risky. So, and even if you just feel like you were born to do market education, <laughs> I I would question whether that's a good marketing strategy for your business. Maybe you should find a way to sell that as a service for others. Anyway. Um, yeah, I think you have to give people, you know, the sign needs to say what they're looking for. And the question then is like, how far can you kind of uh, move them off of their starting point assumptions about what they needed? But if you are in a conversation with them, I don't think of someone like typing into Google some search words as a conversation. But once they've, you know, maybe filled out a form or sent you an email and said, can we talk? Now you're in a conversation and then you can do a lot of education and there's, okay, so it's, it's one off. It's not repeatable necessarily, or it's not scalable. It's you're talking to one prospective client, but there's no reason you can't deploy some scalable stuff. Like, you know, you seem like a great fit. Can I send you a short PDF that we've written up that explains our approach and why you probably think you need this, but you really need something a little different. Like you can do that education in that context much more easily than you can educate the market, right? You can educate a person because they, they've, they're sort of bought into talking to you. And as a part of talking to you, you can, you know, educate them or you can just say, great, we're going to do some branding. Um, we start with a questionnaire that is about uh, your business and your clients. And then all of a sudden now you're doing business strategy <laughs> under the umbrella of branding. It's a little bit of a Trojan horse, I guess, but um, also you could just think of it as well. It's just a prerequisite to us getting good results here, which sounds to me like where you landed Pia is like, well, we got to do this. Let's not uh, get everybody worked up about doing business strategy. Let's just, casually do some business strategy on the way to the branding outcome. I don't, I don't think you can do great branding without solid business strategy, I think is what I came to. Um, yeah. And so if you want to do it at that higher level, there has to be the, the Trojan horse and it's, it's for your own good. <laughs> yeah. Software people run into the same thing and design people too. It's like, you know, the client comes in with assumptions 
which the client doesn't see as assumptions. They just see as like, well, you know, this is how things are. These are the givens of things. No, those are actually assumptions or, uh, you know, preconceptions you had about how this should go. And there's, I think that's almost probably a universal rule. Like for an expert to do their work, you have to override some assumptions um, or get buy-in in in a different area than the client was ready to buy into. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say that. I think that the, um, we're talking about higher level experts, right? Because if somebody is coming to you for um, more of a commoditized service, which is really more of like a freelancer position, then yeah, I, I hire you to design this banner ad and then you design the banner ad and there's, we don't have to exchange these laundry conversations. But if you're hiring someone at, Again, I'll only focus on those premium priced people. Well, then you're really looking for another level of understanding and strategic advice to inform whatever that project is. And if you're looking for that, the assumption is that you don't have it. So, of course, there's going to be a whole bunch of stuff you don't know you don't know. And therefore, the process must be that you come in through the lens of this is the problem I believe I have and the solution I believe will solve it. And then I find an expert who is going to, of course, unpack it more and give me a full holistic answer to that problem or else they wouldn't be worth the (laughs) money they're charging and they wouldn't be delivering the higher level of value that we're talking about. So we are distinguishing that this is about people who are delivering high level expert consulting services. Yeah, I really, this makes me want to interview some medical doctors who have been in practice before WebMD was like the top search result for whatever your uh, symptom is and after that moment, right? Because I would love to know how that has affected their interaction with, with patients. Because, you know, you, you I think of the world of medicine, okay, not simple stuff, but, you know, more exotic stuff like autoimmune diseases or that sort of thing, as a place where there was a time when someone would show up and say, I feel terrible, these are the symptoms, and then the rest they would just leave to the doctor. They would not come, I mean, they might come in with a few sort of loosely held ideas, okay, well, maybe it's this or maybe it's that. But if it's really baffling to them, they would come in with, I don't know what's wrong with me. I just want to feel better. And, uh, you know, when you become an expert in some domain like branding or software, you really want your your clients to show up with that kind of, uh, I mean, it's a humility, right? A sort of loosely held, yeah. okay, I think it might be this, but I, I will drop that idea in a half second if you have a better idea about what's wrong and how to fix it. And now you know, with the ease of access to information, uh, a lot of which looks very authoritative about, okay, if you feel this way, it could be this, could be this. Like, I wonder how doctors handle that because their world is probably a lot more like our world now where clients show up with much more strongly held prior ideas about what to do. Yeah, well, I think they're actually, they, it could be exactly the same. So let me tell you about this uh, interesting experience I had with, we have a family doctor now. We went to mm-hmm. a private doctor like maybe mm-hmm. four or five years ago. After my whole life, I just went to, I never had a doctor, right? It was just like, yeah. I, I never needed to go to a doctor. So I would just go to yeah. whoever, you yeah. know, whatever. And my experience in those, exper- in those instances was when what, what, you spend five, 10 minutes with somebody that you've probably never even met before. Maybe you see them once in a while and you go because you have a cold or maybe you go for a checkup. Yeah. They do a couple of things, that's right. it, right? And I decided to like, let's, let's go and have a doctor that actually has all our files. I don't even know where any of this stuff is. And we've been <laughs> seeing her ever since. And it's, it's a, and what I loved about her, it's almost too much, but she totally brand shrinked us. You know, she literally did our process and it's a requirement to be her, her, uh, her patient is that you come in for a three hour yearly evaluation. And she has us do the most, like the ex- the most blood work ever every year, and she and she's looking at it, and she's and and the thing that's so fa- and she went through all of our history, she does it every year, all this intake. That's amazing. And it's she is a detective, and what's so fascinating is that she doesn't put on this air to your point of this is what it is. She's constantly being like, oh, you know what? I just saw something about that. Let me look it up. Like, I'm going to investigate this. Like, these levels are a little mm-hmm. weird. I want you to get these five <laughs> more tests. And we're like, oh, God, this is intense. But it is 
all of a sudden it made me realize how much medicine is an art. <laughs> and, and when yeah. I think of science, I think of, I always thought of doctors as, yeah, you got these four symptoms, so this is what you have. So here's the medicine that you get. And once I saw her in action, I was like, oh, geez, like this is, yeah. that's what it looks like to be an expert. And of course, and as soon as I saw that, I said, of course, like that's what I'm also trying to do with my clients. And of course, medicine would be like that too. And I just, it opened my eyes to the fact that this is kind of true in all areas <laughs> that have complicated answers to problems. And if you're not getting that level of service, you're probably not actually getting like those thoughtful solutions. You're getting prescribed solutions that may or may not work. And you won't even know why, because nobody really took the time to uncover it. That's that's one of the interesting things about developing as an expert is there is this kind of middle um, phase of that maturation as an expert where you're, so you have solutions that seem to you like good ones. They, they seem to fit the symptoms. Um, they work a fair bit of the time, but they, they don't work sometimes disastrously. Uh, another percentage of the time. And so you lose, con if you are really honest with yourself, you lose confidence during that middle phase because you're like, oh my God, this worked so well the last five times I did it. Why is it not working? And what's actually happened, I think, is a feedback. You're starting to become a real expert. You're getting there. So you're getting access to more challenging stuff. And the nuances within those more challenging problems are confounding the ability of your simple recipe to work. And it's like an invitation to go deeper with your expertise and actually paradoxically a little broader. Like sometimes, let's say you're a specialist in some part of the body. Well, that part of the body is not floating around by itself. You know, if you're a specialist in uh, the feet, those are connected to the heart. They're not close to the heart, but they are connected. So you have to learn about the whole system. And so, you know, once someone gets to that level of expertise, they have to find out how to inspire confidence in their patients and their clients while, like in the way that those middle phase experts did. Oh, you've got that problem? Oh my God, I've got the recipe for you. It's, in, it's amazing. We solve it every time, right? Like that inspires confidence. The advanced expert has to be able to inspire confidence too. Otherwise, they can't get the buy-in. They need to get results. People will quit. But then they also have to show up with this like, well, there's uncertainty about what the actual problem is. I'm going to have to do a lot more tests before I really know. But they need the confidence on the patient to stick with it, <laughs> mm -hmm. to believe that this extra work is going to be worth it. It's a really interesting you know, paradox. It's not like everything automatically gets easier and better as you get more expertise. Things actually get harder. Yeah. I think that's why there's not as many really you know, advanced experts as the world needs. I think that's such a good point. I'm sure everybody here can relate to that too. I certainly had that experience. The more I learned, the less, I think it's called the Dunning-Kruger Kruger effect. Have you ever heard of that? Like the more I think that's you learn, related, yeah. the, the less confident you feel about it because the more you see how much you don't know yeah. and all of a sudden you have all this information that you're only kind of understanding, whereas there's a bliss in less. <laughs> Ignorance yeah. is bliss, they say, right? Like if you only yeah. know this amount and you have no idea that that exists, then you do feel like you have the answer and you can feel really confident in that. And that's so interesting. You're, you're totally right. There's this middle part where you're going to get you know, less confident. And then as you get into the most confident or the more advanced confidence as you build your expertise, you have to find that that you have to I'm going to repeat this back to you. You have to communicate that confidence without having that blissful, ignorant confidence from the beginning, which is just bulldozing in and saying, this is the answer. And instead, show up with the, I have a lot of great answers, and I'm going to need more information to help you figure out the right one, which is really how we're saying that's really yeah. what true expertise looks like. Yeah, it's it's a delicate thing. And, and the folks that can figure out how to do both like in a really honest way have just, I mean, there's a reason that we pay those people a lot of money, I think is what it would be. Uh, and it's probably the kind of thing you help your clients with. Uh, I'm sure that's part of it is, you know, that 
like communication that is both honest and confident. It's inspiring. That is the key for running profitable intensives and running mm. profitable projects. In my experience, it is the being a confident leader and communicating, having really good communication skills. And so the first part of our process that I teach everyone is this lead product. And it's, it's exactly that. It's a, Hey, these are our packages. You're probably one of them, but we don't, but I won't let you buy them and you can't do them until we do this inquiry mm -hmm. until we do this discovery session, something that I can mm -hmm. really get a lay of the land. So I can actually tell you that's what you need as opposed to just taking your word that that's what you need, because that may or may be, not be true. And even if it's true, there may be other pieces that you aren't aware of. And I think the, I think the thing that a lot of my students struggle with is, and I heard this recently, they were like, especially because this process, if you're really great, like I don't want to teach people great communication and leadership skills that hides lack of expertise and knowledge, right? Because you can really do a lot of these things and get that buy-in. And I've had that feeling too, almost a little imposter. Wow, I know that everything I show my client, they're gonna love and they're gonna take it, so I better be right. You know, like I better be right, yeah. this better be good. And I, I know I'm good, but you know, ultimately in design and branding, there is a subjective element to this. So you can't, yeah. there is no right. And there's no one like in the back end, you know, you won, that's the correct answer. So you got to yeah. have confidence in yourself. Um, a lot of our process is to actually build your own confidence and kind of like check yourself and check that, check your work so that you aren't just going off on a tangent. But I do have students say like, I think this is what they should do, but like, I don't know that I'm super confident in it. And what do we do in those interim steps when we're still struggling with our own confidence in our advice because we're in that middle place, to your point, where we're not quite sure and we want to do right by the client and we know that our confidence is going to be an important ingredient into this relationship and their success because if we're not confident, we're basically, and if we say, this is what most people do, right? Most designers do this. Well, you choose because then it's not my responsibility. And my opinion is by saying it's your responsibility to the client, you're actually making it harder for them to make a confident decision. And so you need to bring that confidence. And you see what I'm saying? There's like this murky part where you don't want to lie, <laughs> but you also aren't like the 10 year, 20 year expert that you feel like you should be if to say something confidently. Um, what would you say to like being in that position? How can you communicate that? I, I was in that position um, a month and a half ago. I, I started a new service um, where I'm doing more done for you stuff than I have for clients in a long while. And I said to this prospect, I said, this is a new service. I will probably over deliver because of that. You can also expect, you know, we're going to have to figure a few things out along the way. Are you okay with that? I mean, that's like almost verbatim what I said. And he was fine with that. Not everybody would be. Not everybody has been. That's fine. I mean, it's fine if you have enough conversations where what comes out the end of that sort of honest, uh, it's an honesty filtering process. It's a, I'm going to work hard for you. This service would be a lot more sort of buttoned up and figured out uh, a year or two years from now. But, you know, you're early on and I want you to know that. I want to be honest with you. And I just think that kind of unvarnished honesty buys uh not from everyone, but it, it can buy trust enough to get you over the gap mm. that we're talking about here. So you're in that middle phase. Your confidence has taken a beating <laughs> because some things haven't worked out the way they used to. And it's interesting. I, I'm repeating myself here, but they used to work. It's the same yeah. recipe. What has That's not changed. You're What's fine. changed is the problems have gotten a little more uh, gnarly and hard to, to solve. And so your confidence takes a beating and you're like, oh crap, maybe I'm not cut out for this or whatever, right? You've got your internal story. I just think that unvarnished honesty with a client is the best way that I have come up with to deal with that. I love that. I think that's great. And I think the, the thing you didn't say, but is implied that I want everyone else to hear is, you know, this happened to you a month and a half ago. You have a vast proof of your experience and knowledge. They are willing to take that bet with you because 
there is a level of trust and belief that you are bringing expertise. And so it's the way that you're positioning this particular engagement and the way that you're doing it that is new and is not going to yeah. be perfect. And that's an opportunity for um, anybody who's been working for a while. That I mean, and that will kind of always be true. You could kind of argue that that's always the case as you are leveling up your services or your offers because every time you do it if you're willing to put a little extra to make it a little better it's going to kind of be a new version of it yeah right yeah and this i mean you know variation to this happen i'll just use the world of software which i'm a bit more familiar with you know you've been doing uh engineering work like coding the software and now you are designing the whole system you move up to that architectural level it's intimidating yeah. um this new like you don't have like you're putting aside tools that you're really comfortable with and using a different set of tools and that's another kind of okay i'm new to this but i, I still think the same solution applies you're just honest like i you know I'm going to kill it. I'm so motivated to do good at this, but you need to know, uh, I haven't done a ton of this before. Right. So you won't hear me referencing war stories about how I used to do this five years ago. Cause I didn't, I'm new to this, but you know, I'm bringing this energy and dedication and this willingness to be honest with you about the mistakes that will be made along the way. I just, yeah, I, th I think it all comes back to that kind of honesty. Yeah. I, it just earns you so much trust. Um, and I'm not sure there's any way to do it wrong per se, other than just being pessimistic as you are combining pessimism and honesty, I think is maybe the one way to do it wrong. <laughs> so just be honest about the risks, but be super confident in your abilities. And by the way, I think some people think that that confidence in your abilities means that you're confident that it will go a certain way. Whereas I think you can build, you can rely on the fact that you know you will do right by the client no matter what, that's where the confidence comes from. As long as you can trust yeah. yourself to do that, then you can have confidence. Yeah, to put it in terms of process, it's like I have a process for addressing when things don't go right. I'm going to notify you. I'm going to you know, uh, not blame anybody other than myself if I think it was my fault. And then I'm going to propose one or two good solutions. Okay, that's a process that I just described. Mm -hmm. It's a thing you do the same way every time, no matter what the, th you know, the specifics are. And that could be a source of confidence. And articulating that to your prospective client could be a source for them to trust in you. You just say, this is what we're going to do if this happens. God forbid, hope it doesn't happen. But if it happens, this is how we will handle it. That's very confidence inspiring. Absolutely. I think. Everything you say resonates so much with me, and I feel like that's why, that's why you're my number one mentioned friend, <laughs> my colleagues and, and people who listen to me, because there's something about the way that you talk about it, even though it's in a slightly different space, that is so relatable to everything that my small branding agencies uh, are experiencing too. Similar challenges and similar approaches, which really just has to do with leading with that confidence and having good processes. Philip, what are you, uh, so what's your focus now? I am working on a book on point of view that I actually wrote. And then I was like, oh, there's such a better way to explain this. <laughs> so I'm rewriting the book. It's already like self-published. You can buy it. Don't buy it. Wait till I rewrite it. <laughs> and also you published a book that you're rewriting now. Yeah. That's like the ultimate. I changed my mind blog post. Well, I, it's it's a it's a better uh, to be clear. It is a better way of talking, like uh, introducing people to the idea. There'll be okay. I, I should be able to reuse fifty seventy percent of the old book, but Got it. it it needs a kind of a different Lens. you know uh, structure and yeah. Gotcha. So um, I have been coaching people on point of view. That's been fun. I so I have this service called eighty twenty agency marketing dot com eighty twenty agency marketing dot com it's the numbers not the yeah. letters and um, that's a little more done for you marketing uh, set up with you know with my particular slant applied to it uh -huh. you need to have a point of view you need to have a clearly defined position uh, but it's with me doing a little bit more of the setup work than I would have done in the past 
So there's that. And then, yeah, pretty much uh, individual coaching of people who want uh, their business development to work better. And is that specifically for these software service companies or do you work with services in general? I can help software people the best, uh-huh. but I don't say no to <laughs> That's uh, a million dollar folks question. who, you know, like it's obvious that we kind of click together and I, I understand their market well enough. Um, I'm working with, on point of view, some folks who are consultants to the nonprofit space. That would be an example of the outside of the software world where, you know, there's, there's enough sort of shared language and so forth. So usually it's, it's uh, software developers, but sometimes it's, you know, indie consultants of some kind like management or marketing consultants. That's, that's generally it, but Again, you know, I'll I'll hear I'll hear other people's pitch on why they want to work with me and sometimes it makes sense and sometimes it doesn't. That's a great positioning. Pitch me on why I should work with you. I like that. Yeah. I think yeah. more people can should use that. Um where can we find your new book? What is it called? It's called The Point of View Guide. Okay. Uh it's not on Amazon yet. It's available as an ePub on my website, philipmorganconsulting.com. But again, you know, Oh, that's the, I, that's the first version. Yeah. The point of view guide. Okay. And you'll what's get the, the next version when it comes out. <laughs> okay. So if you get the first version, then you'll get the next version? Yeah. Is that the idea? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's one way to do it. That's um, one way to do it. The other way is just to join my email list on philipmorganconsulting.com, and I'm sure I'll talk about it a lot when the uh, version two is out. I love it. Well, perhaps that will coincide with the launching of this episode. We'll make sure to link to all of that in the show notes. Philip Morgan, always such a pleasure to see you and talk to you. I love our discussions and the places they go. <laughs> They're always uh, surprising and give a lot of insights. And so thank you so much for coming on. You bet. Thanks for having me on, Pia. 